Good. Hey, our first guest here on the program is Senator Jason Barrett. Good morning, JB. Good morning. So uh, I, I presume that you got the uh, the Tudor's Biscuit Company up and running well <laughs> enough that they could survive without your presence, right? Yeah, they're, uh, everyone's doing a good job. I check in with them, obviously, and uh, staff there is doing a great job. So. Have, have you moved the Anthony's inside the same building yet? Oh, yeah, we did that uh, two weeks after Tudor's opened. Oh, very nice. And, and and how is business, by the way? Good. Yeah, it's going really well. And uh, I was kind of under the uh, under a little pressure to get things moved before I came down here. Um, so we were able to get that done, which uh, made life a little easier for me. You got a nice compliment from the health director yesterday, Bill Kearns, who said that uh, as they went down to the Capitol to meet with our uh, legislators and Eastern Panhandle delegation that uh, you were a good host, Jason. Oh, well, thank you. That was kind of them to say. Yeah, very nice. And I yeah. I heard the same, Senator. Um, one of our um, hospice uh, folks was down there for Leadership Jefferson. Um, yeah, and I met said, with him yesterday. Yeah, yeah. and said that um, everyone was extremely gracious and um, it was a great learning experience. And I said, well, you didn't get to go to committee hearings, right? And she said, no. I said, that's where the sausage is made. So uh, maybe next time, yeah. right? Yeah, and they were, uh, I spoke with them yesterday morning, and they came to the Senate floor to watch the proceedings. And yesterday was one of our longest days on the floor, and it was primarily due to some resolutions. We won in particular, uh, where there were three nominees for Medal of Valor for three uh, police officers who uh, were wounded in the line of duty. Um, um, so it, it, there were a couple of speeches uh, in regards to, to those gentlemen. So it, it took a little longer. So um, the, the leadership Jefferson class, I don't think, got to, got to see, um, you know, any of the committee meetings or, you know, as you said, how the sausage is made. So. <laughs> Uh, Jason, several years ago, we dealt with medical cannabis legislation out of the yeah. Capitol, and uh, we got it enacted in, in, in certain forms. Uh, banking became an issue with that, and I know now you're working on SB 677, medical cannabis and edible forms. Can you tell me how we have uh, structured it financially so that uh, we can do this business and, and not uh, be uh, on the wrong side of the banking laws and, and how, if indeed, it will work the same way with edible forms? Well, you're, you're testing my memory a little bit on the banking information. I, I do remember that. I, I remember the then treasurer, Purdue, was um, really involved with the process, uh, you know, as, to be able to for people to be able to deposit into banks to either dispensaries or growers processors to be able to deposit money into the banks that um, where they felt it would be safe and wouldn't be seized by the federal government but also for the state to take uh, money from from those individuals who um, were, were getting were submitting application to get licensure so that the state had the same issue of being able to deposit that money and, and we worked that out and I, and I wish I'd, I had a better memory but that has been a number of years ago but but Senate bill 677 deals with edible forms of, of cannabis and that was uh, a debate um, in the house when I was there when we originally passed medical cannabis I believe the bill as it came from the Senate at the time allowed medical cannabis but um, Speaker Armstead and, and uh, Judiciary Chairman Schott and a number of other members um, who didn't support medical cannabis at all uh, were able, they were able to get enough support to, to pull out uh, some of the language that, that allowed edibles. And I, yeah, I, I think it's, it's uh, important to, to clarify what exactly, how, how limited these edible forms are actually going to be. I mean, it's, uh, it, it can't be anything that, that uh, is a candy or uh, into brownies or anything like that. This is probably, this will probably want to be one of the strictest edible laws in the country. Um, and it's, it's primarily just gelatins or lozenges. And I think that's, you know, probably what you would see the most would be the lozenges and that they have to be, there's a whole list of geometric shapes that are, that are, will be permit, permitted to, to be able to, uh, to be created so that they're not in, um, some candy form or a cartoon character or anything like that. I mean, it's this bill is, is really strict and, and does not allow any type of uh, edible form of cannabis to be marketed 
uh, in any way to, to children. Uh, this is, again, just lozenges and, um, and, and gelatins, and they can't even be bright colors, and it specifically says that in the bill. And um, the, the current forms that are allowed are like pills and oils and uh, some topicals, uh, liquid, uh, I believe, well, I know that there's, there, as long as it's, uh, it could be vaped, if, if it's a, um, uh, if it meets all the criteria for, for a specific uh, vape pen uh, to be used. So uh, what goes on now, I think the reason for the bill is that um, it also limits the THC in each lozenge um, to, a, to a low amount. And, and what happens now is people will get um, medical cannabis and, and their the, the way in which they want to administer it to themselves is to put it in uh, some type of baked good or, or some type of um, edible uh, food, obviously, and, and the dosages can be all over the place. And so I think this is a much more controlled way uh, to allow people to use medical cannabis um, in an edible form that, that is safer than them doing it themselves. Jason, re re remind me, refresh me, the distribution is how? Is it by prescription? Is it over the counter? Uh, or how do you get, how do you, how will it be distributed? You, you have to have a medical card that's, for, that's given to you by a, a licensed physician in West Virginia. And then, and then you would go to a dispensary. Okay. And then what is your sense, Jason, if you have any in this regard to, are medical professionals um, amenable to um, to writing this script, or because I know the the topic does come up in um, in hospice, and our medical director, um, you know, works very much in um, in conjunction with the providers, with the patients' providers, but she does not write um, at this point um, for medical cannabis. But that's surprising because folks that are struggling uh, at the end of life with pain and um, uh, a lot of times don't have much appetite. Right. Well, and so those and, are folks that are that are usually are are at the top of the list of people we hear that that benefit the most from medical cancer. Well, and I think it's. I mean, that's not to say that it doesn't happen. She is in um, in conversation with the primary doc in order to do that because. You know, as I think you know, there's there's the situation of drug diversion at hospice, unfortunately, and um, you know, opening that door is um, again very controlled. Has to be that sure. way. Um, and I'm what I'm saying is it's not never. Um, it's just in conjunction with someone else so that there are more controls. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, I mean, it is a different way to, um, you know, it's not like a doctor calls in a prescription for medical cannabis and you run down to CVS and pick it up or Patterson's or anywhere else. I mean, that's, that's just not the way it works. It, you know, if you get a medical card, then you're then able to purchase um, uh, at, a, at a West Virginia uh, cannabis dispensary. Jason, are you at all surprised at how attitudes have turned around in such a short period of time on medical cannabis? I can remember having this discussion five years ago, and uh, there was a lot of concern about these types of bills at West Virginia going across the country in terms of uh, maybe sending mixed messages about the use of marijuana as a medical option. Yet uh, today, as we talk about this, it is hardly a concern that's mentioned out loud any longer. Yeah, I mean, you're right. There has been uh, evolution of an opinion, uh, I think, across the state. I think a number of years ago, there was some polling out that showed that the people of West Virginia were overwhelming in support of the use of uh, cannabis for, for medical purposes. Um, I, I think that the legislature and members of the legislature were a little bit behind um, the average West Virginia uh, resident on that issue. And, uh, and, and this bill is... You know, to say this is expanding the medical cannabis program in West Virginia is a very far stretch. Yeah, it, it, it simply adds um, that you can now use a gelatin or a lozenge um, a, as a form uh, of administering medical cannabis. I mean, it, it's, smoking it is still 
not allowed. You still can't do it in public places. I mean, uh, this really isn't an expansion by any sense of the imagination, in my view. Uh, it's just a, an easier way to administer it uh, to someone. Uh, it's just to give them a lozenge that will dissolve um, the same way, I, I guess, a sore throat lozenge would. Hey, by the way, before you go, Bill, we are having a technical issue with our Facebook feed. The TV feed and the radio feed are working fine, but the Facebook feed is having an issue with the Internet. Colin is working on that right now. As we speak, Bill. Yeah, Jason, do you see a migration? This picks up on Rob's uh, point about a change of attitudes in, in the last four or five years. Do you see that West Virginia will migrate either slowly or more at a more rapid pace to what we're seeing in Colorado and other places where cannabis is distributed very, very loosely, very freely? I, I don't know that we're, I mean, I guess you're speaking specifically about adult use where as long as you're an adult, um, you can go purchase it uh, at the dispensary without any type of card. Um, and, and in those situations, it is you know normally taxed and there's significant revenue to the state. Um, I, I don't know that we're going to get there anytime soon. Um, I, to be honest, it's not really something that's on my radar to, to really go out here and push um, because I think that it's it's um, I, I think that the, the process to get the card and have access uh, for your medical conditions. Um, I don't think is overly burdensome um, on on the individual that that is looking to to utilize medical cannabis. Moving on from that subject to another, we're going to tap in uh, Maria's uh, newspaper expertise here for SB two sixty four, reducing legal ads rate newspapers can <laughs> charge. What's the story behind this? Well, it's it's a conversation that we've had down here a number of years um, regarding. Um, governments paying uh, newspapers to run legal ads and you, know, you see all the you know when there's delinquent property tax there are pages and pages and pages and you know there are specific rates that it are in state code uh, that the government specifically you know the county or city government would have to pay to these newspapers and it's based on circulation so the larger your newspaper circulation is the higher the rate uh, in which the newspaper is entitled to. Um, I, I think if you look at circulation in any newspaper across the state, they're all way down from where they once were. Um, and I don't think that newspaper legal ads is the best way to communicate to the taxpayer that they have delinquent taxes. Uh, you know, this is 2024, and we do have the internet and and there are, I think there are better ways, but, but this bill doesn't eliminate that requirement. It simply says that every newspaper, no matter what the circulation is, will charge the same rate, and it's at the lowest rate. And, and the press association down here, they, they cry wolf every time that this <laughs> issue comes up. That they come to us and they say, well, we're going to do this study, and we're, we're going to make these other concessions. Um, and I don't believe anything they say, to be honest with you, because they have told us in the past that they were going to do things and they didn't do them. Um, and, and they're really just trying to run the clock out on the 60 days. Um, and then at the, end of the, at the end of the 60 days, they have uh, protected the newspapers to be continue to be propped up by taxpayers. And I think it's wrong. Yeah, and I agree with that, uh, Jason. Uh, 99% of the people can get have access to the internet, either in the home or the library or with friends. It's available. The county county spent a tremendously a large of amount of money on these ads, and and I agree with you. We're 2024. It's a new uh, new age, new technology. Why do we have to continue to publish in the hard media when you can do everything in the soft media? Yeah, I, I would agree, and. Um, uh, it's unfortunate. We've been dealing with this issue I, probably since I've been here, uh, and it's, it's something that we've tried and tried to, to make some uh, some headway on, and um, the press association just fights it as hard as they can. They've, the, the, the latest thing that they've come up with is now the counties are making money on this, and um, and I, I don't know who, I, you know, I was born on Friday, but it wasn't last Friday, and I don't know how in the world they're going to try to convince me or anybody else that counties are actually or cities are making money on uh, legal ads when, you know, because the, the, they do charge, but um, the, the, the local government can charge the taxpayer some amount, but it in no way offsets the amount of money and expense that it takes to run these ads multiple times, pay the staff to do all this stuff. And um, so it, it's, 
Yep. It's an issue that we shouldn't be fighting this long. And uh, but as long as the the press association is is doing what they're doing down here, and um, it, it's unfortunate, but um, you know we're going to keep uh, plugging along and see if we can at least uh, make some headway. Because again, this is this is taxpayer money that's being used to to run these legal ads that not many very that not many people are reading newspapers anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 run them. it's prejudiced against radio and TV stations. Yeah, there have. you go, there you go. And Jason, I, you know, again, it's been a little while, but we do have um, county officials coming in um, to weigh in um, a little bit later on this show. But I can remember my involvement with the West Virginia Press Association, but. Um, I think you're absolutely right. The circulation in general has diminished um, greatly over the years. And um, the people who who look at legal ads for that purpose, I mean, and again, somebody I know in my family um, has to uh, use legal ads for his office. And, you know, it's it's difficult to get it right and um and costly i i agree with you on that so it's, it's very costly the counties that's a, a significant financial uh penalty the counties pay sb 467 jason may negatively affect vfw's ambets moose clubs elk lodges and set and uh, etc what's the story behind sb 467 well, that that's certainly my take on it and and it had, the bill has a lot of sponsors, and, and the bill really deals with charitable raffle aimed at helping volunteer fire departments, and, and that's how it's being sold by those that are that are pushing the bill. Um, but I don't think that's what it does. I think this is there is a company in Ohio that is trying to um, bring machines in to convenience stores, uh, essentially like raffle or tip jar machines that that in a lot of cases really resemble a thought machine and. Um, and, and it's, it's, to be honest, it's, it's legal to do uh, that type of raffle in a convenience store now. Um, however, what I, I believe these folks are trying to do is to kind of create a monopoly uh, so that they're really the only game in town that, it, that is able to sell these um, charitable raffle tickets and boards and those type of things. Um, and and one, one of the things it says in the bill is that um, no one... Uh, in the state of West Virginia without a charitable raffle license would be able to buy any type of charitable ticket, raffle ticket, raffle board, anything like that. So, you know, if somebody has a, a travel baseball team and, and they want to um, sell some type of raffle, uh, you know, to help the kids go to Myrtle Beach to play in a tournament, um, you know, they, they, they can't do these raffles. They're not, they wouldn't be able to purchase these raffle boards to, to be able to do that because they would have to pay a $500 fee to the state of West Virginia to get a charitable raffle license. And a lot of the, the organizations that you mentioned, uh, the VFW, the AMVETS, Moose, Elks, all those type of uh, fraternal organizations that, that do a lot of good in the communities to either help veterans or uh, to help uh, with scholarships uh, the way the Elks does and, and, and uh, the way the moose does as well, um, you know, this bill really changes uh, how they're able to spend some of that money uh, to be able to keep the doors open. A lot of our fraternal organizations uh, and veterans organizations like that across West Virginia are really struggling. And, and so these, these raffle boards and tip jars and those type of things are a way for them to be able to keep the doors open, uh, to be able to um, you know, provide this community service that they do. And these, and, and these raffle boards and, and tip jars really, to be honest, help keep them afloat. And uh, I think what this bill does really limits their ability to use money to be able to keep the doors open. Uh, it creates a monopoly for one company um, in Ohio. Uh, one of the things that I think this company is concerned about is that there are organizations and, and establishments in Ohio that come to West Virginia to purchase these boards from uh, storefronts in West Virginia, and, and this company doesn't like that because they want to sell uh, to the Ohio uh, establishments. And so um, I've made it my mission to try to stop this bill this year, and it does have a lot of sponsors and has some support. But uh, I think as we educate people and, and really explain to them um, what this could do to the uh, 
to the VFWs and the AMBETs and others. Um, you know, and I, and I understand why the senator sponsored it because you know it's being sold to them as a way to really help volunteer fire departments. Well, volunteer fire departments already have charitable raffle and bingo licenses if they choose to, and I know some of them in our area do, and they run bingo and they run charitable raffle, but this would really uh, limit their ability to use the, the money in a way that really helps them um, um, carry out their mission. Do you have to run off to caucus now, Jason? Uh, I got a minute or so. Uh, I got that, probably one question I can get to. Give us the latest update on your county commission vacancy bill, SB 542. Oh, good. I, I appreciate you asking me about that. Yeah, we um, in Senate Gov Org, we passed that bill out yesterday. So it, it does the things that I've, I've outlined to you. There, uh, in the instance where there's a five member commission, uh, there's a vacancy. Uh, the the if the vacancy is made by a Republican. Uh, and there are two Republicans on the commission, um, they would strike first in a, in a scenario where they, the four of them could not agree uh, on a candidate. Um, the, the, they would, the two Republicans would strike first from a list of five names instead of three. That's a change in the bill that the, the local county executive committee uh, would prepare. So, you know, again, this is aimed at, um, you know, the one problem that I saw in the, in the, 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 the way that the Jefferson County played out was, there was no uh, provision for a tie in tenure, and this deals with, with that. Um, it starts with party, goes to tenure, and then if there's a tie in the amount of tenure, then there's a random draw. Now, clearly that was cleared up in Jefferson County because one commissioner uh, deferred to the other of the two that had equal tenure. So um, this is just, uh, you know, we ran into a problem in Jefferson County uh, with this that we didn't know really existed. and. I think this is a pretty simple fix to it, and it really, to be honest, it really only applies to both Berkeley and Jefferson County. Uh, they're the only two with five with a five-member commission. Yeah, and I would suggest instead of random draw, you give the tiebreaker to the person who got the most votes. Well, we're not doing it that way. That's my suggestion. <laughs> Appreciate the suggestion. Um, not going yeah. there. Let the yeah. people win. Let yeah. the people speak. Hey, Jason, thank you. Appreciate it, man. Hey, thanks. Take care. Have a good day. Jason Barrett, Senator, 16th. And uh, he makes Thursday, sorry, this is Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday appearances with us here. Mac Hornby makes Thursday appearances on the program.